Hi everyone, this is the first segment, video segment for Unit 2. It covers energy and coal. And I just want you to know that um, page 16 and 17 of your book cover the energy cycle, and chapter 7 covers renewable and non-renewable energy resources, but there is a lot of content that is not in your book that's only in the notes. So be very careful on your note taking and your listening and your understanding from these notes. Where does energy for the earth come from? Pretty much for our planet. We know that energy can't be created nor destroyed. It's got to come from somewhere. And most of the energy from our earth, this third rock from our sun, comes from the sun. So solar energy represents 99.985% of the energy that enters the earth. Will you have to memorize that percent? No, but you do need to realize that there is not 100%, so there's other um, sources of energy, and we'll talk about those other two in just a second. Uh, solar energy is the main energy source for plants, which, which puts the energy into the biosphere, which is very important for those producers and consumers. Um, solar energy is also the primary cause of weathering rock and forming soil, which is not something you really think about. Um, consider exa an example like the sun warming pavement makes the pavement expand. When the pavement contracts as a result of cooling or less sun, like winter, the, the difference between the expansion and the contraction actually breaks that up and forms smaller particles. So this is what's happening. It's also responsible, sun is also responsible for any of the weather actual weather in the atmosphere. I know that's not listed there, but it's something to keep in mind. 40% um, of what comes to our planet is actually reflected back out to space. Um, we're going to learn a term called albedo later, but that's how reflective surfaces are. What you're seeing here is an image of the sun. You can see the photosphere there, um, kind of bumpy granulating. and we'll talk more about that in the astronomy unit. But that is the primary source of energy for this planet. I also threw in an image of a solar car, and this is not something that you would see you know, normally on the highway, obviously, but there are universities that have programs, groups, kind of like a club, that will put together these solar cars and race them across the United States. Western has a program, and they usually, I think it's every three years or so, they, they do this um, race. So, you know, depending on where you end up at college, if this is interesting to you, you should seek out if there's a club that exists at the university. Geothermal energy represents 0.013% of the ener energy that enters our planet. Now, that's a weird way to say that enters, but that's primarily um, going to be entering the surface. This is energy from heat within the Earth. So because of the high pressure and the radioactive elements, we do have energy that comes out from the interior of our planet. Geothermal. Geo means Earth. Thermal means heat. So it's responsible for any crustal movements that we had, which generates, you know, the mountains and the trenches. Um, it powers volcanoes, geysers, and earthquakes. And we know that three to five feet below the ground surface is a pretty constant temperature of 45 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit in the um, northerly part of the United States. And in the southerly part of the United States, it averages between 50 and 70. So we're going to talk more about that later on. But what you're seeing here is a geyser, volcano, and then this is the ring of fire where there's a lot of volcanic activity due to the geothermal energy that we have. So there's three types of energy, solar, geothermal, and then finally tidal. This is energy from the rise and fall of the tides. This is not waves. I repeat, this is not wave action. Waves are caused by wind. Tides are actually caused by the pull of the moon on our planet and ultimately oceans are fluid so respond to that pull more than the land does. So therefore we have tides. Um, it represents the last part of the total energy, 0.002%. Like I said, you don't have to memorize those percentages, but you do need to know the three types of energy, solar, geothermal, and tidal. And the fact that solar um, is responsible for the most. This image is showing you an exaggeration here, but we have the moon the earth, and an exaggerated ocean line. You can see on the side that's facing the moon we have a bulge 
and on the opposite side due to physics, the laws of physics, there's a bulge on the opposite side. So this side right here and right behind it um, are actually low tide. These are high tide and Earth is rotating. If I could take this and rotate it, that tide would remain right there. So if you were a person standing right here, you'd be moving across into low tide, and as you moved around, you would experience high tide over here. Those tides, where they are positioned on the planet, don't move. Well, I should say they kind of move, but they only move when the um, moon moves. So they follow the motion of the moon. So it's very slow. Um, so you might experience a couple of tides throughout the day. This is just showing, you know, low tides in this area. It can zoom up. The high tides can go way in and then they come back and flow back out. So three um, sources of energy for the planet Earth come from solar, geothermal, and tidal. Energy has a cycle. You learn in physics that it's not created nor destroyed. It's only converted from one form to another. That happens to be the first law of thermodynamics, if you remember. So what you need to understand in this unit is that energy goes from one form to another, and I have an example here. I have a few examples. So we have energy from our sun. That's solar. Plants take it in, store it as kinetic and chemical energy as they grow and produce fruits and as they store it as sugars. They die. They compact over years. That is a potential form of energy in the carbon compounds, and it's also chemical. It forms coal, which is cut out a little bit, sorry, which is a form of potential and chemical energy. And then when it's burned, it's converted, that energy is converted to heat and light. Um, here's another energy conversion example. You have sunlight, which is thermal and light, a form of electromagnetic radiation also. The lake absorbs that thermal energy and light energy and warms, converting it to more thermal energy. The movement of water molecules increases. This is kinetic energy, and it takes with it the heat, which is evaporation. And that transfers, evaporation actually transfers the heat that was in the water to heat in the atmosphere, which heat in the atmosphere we know can generate storms and all kinds of energy situations. It also can, on a smaller scale, produce um, different pressure areas producing wind, which wind is a form of kinetic energy. Wind can be, um, that kinetic, kinetic energy can turn a windmill, windmill or turbine, which is a kinetic form of energy, and turns a generator and produces electricity, which is another form of energy. So you can see there's a lot of energy conversions along the way. Here's another example that I just want you to think about. We're not going to really cover too much, but um, this was a scenario that was set up by another teacher a while ago, and I thought it was fun. So one day you decide to order a juicy and delicious hamburger from your favorite restaurant. Consider the all the 100 all beef patty and the energy it will provide your body. Think about where the energy um, came from for this meat and the energy transfers and transformations along the way. I mean you have your basic sun goes to plant, plant goes to cow providing the meat, but also you have, this is gross, but you have to butcher the cow, um, cut it up into the, the meat components, and you have to store that meat in coolers, which require electricity. You have to transport that meat, which is, requires fuel. I mean, there's all kinds of energy that is like behind the scenes. It has to go into the processing and the transferring of that hamburger. Um, is energy destroyed in the process? I hope your answer is no, only converted from one form to another. Okay, you're going to be responsible for understanding the difference between what's renewable and what's considered non-renewable. Renewable energy resources are replaced in nature at a rate close to its rate of use, meaning that we, the amount that we use is less than the amount replaced. So we'll never run out. We'll never run out of renewables. Please don't confuse renewable with recyclable because non-renewables mostly are recyclable. There's a few renewables things that are recyclable, are, uh, recyclable also, but non, but excuse me, renewable does not mean recyclable. Be careful about that mess up. Um, examples of renewable energy resources, sun, wind, moving water, wood, heat from the earth's interior, all of these things are used less than they are, can be replaced. Non-renewable, on the other hand, is used faster than it can be naturally replaced. So it's used faster than it's replaced, and we will eventually run out of non-renewables.
So you can only imagine, you know, the mentality. We, we want to switch our energy resources to re renewable because they'll never run out. But there are some very good um, benefits to using non-renewables that we'll talk about later. Examples of any non-renewable energy resources would be anything that has to be mined out of the ground. Pretty much the rock cycle had to put it there, and we all know that the rock cycle is super duper long. So it takes a very long time to replace that, and the way at the rate we're using it, for example, coal has to be mined. We burn coal in a matter of seconds, whereas it took millions of years to be replaced. So anything that's mined required um, sedimentation, pressure, or the rock cycle to put it there. So fossil fuels, coal oil, also called petroleum, natural gas, and nuclear energy like uranium-235, all are non-renewable. Um, we are going to be talking about energy efficiency in class with some labs and activities, so I wanted to include a little slide about this. Um, Efficiency is how much of the energy put into a system actually does useful work, which is energy out. So energy in versus energy out. What are we getting out of it? We know that we get less energy out no matter what, but through because of heat. Um, so because heat is usually generated with any kind of system, you end up with never getting 100% efficient materials. So it's usually expressed as a percentage and according to the second law of thermodynamics that you learn in physics, each energy conversion there is a release of thermal or heat energy, so making the system less efficient. You can see this light bulb, energy is going in to the system, electricity, and we get heat and light out from that light bulb. Obviously the, the useful work or energy is going to be in the form of the light and we don't want heat from this lamp. So that is going to be, that's going to make this light bulb less efficient. If it was 100% efficient, we would be getting electricity in and we would only be getting light out, but we're not. And most appliances, you guys, produce some form of heat. Think about how warm your computer gets or how, or how warm your cell phone gets when it's being used a lot. So nothing is really um, ever 100% efficient. Okay, non-renewable energies, we have a large category of fossil fuels in general. So fossil fuels formed from the remains of organisms that lived millions of years ago. Um, pretty much the sun came in, sunlight came in, photosynthesis by plants stored that energy as chemical form of energy like sugars, and that got com compacted over time through pressure and heat. So it's very, very concentrated carbon and hydrogen. Um, these are composed mostly of hydrocarbons, carbon and hydrogen, and they are produced when forests or wetlands, ancient forests and wetlands, had materials die, and instead of decomposition with oxygen, it decomposed without oxygen, and so therefore it kept that carbon um, and hydrogen intact. You can see that this is kind of a walkthrough of Here's some water, there's some dead plants accumulating. Here's the same later layer over time. These become fossils. More pressure, more um, heat sedimentation creates coal here and oil here and natural gas. They don't always occur you know, together like that, like this image shows, but this is kind of how it works. So you have more and more layers happening. This is usually an impermeable rock so it doesn't seep in through it. It's stuck. So these would be reserves right here of coal, oil, and natural gas. So they're not fossil in the shape of a fossil, but they're solid, liquid, or, or gas form of carbon and hydrogen that originated from plants and animals that lived millions of years ago. I'm going to need to stop this segment, but um, I'm going to have an... I still have more to talk about in this particular segment, so you're going to need to open up another um, video because I will be restricted to 15 minutes and it's almost been that right now. So just open up the second round of segment one and continue your notes.